Part four, chapter eleven of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four: A Voyage to the Country of the Houyhnhnms. Chapter eleven. The author's dangerous voyage. He arrives at New Holland, hoping to settle there. Is wounded with an arrow by one of the natives. Is seized and carried by force into a Portuguese ship. The great civilities of the captain. The author arrives at England. I began this desperate voyage on February 15, 1714-15, at nine o'clock in the morning. The wind was very favourable. However, I made use at first only of my paddles, but, considering I should soon be weary, and that the wind might chop about, I ventured to set up my little sail, and thus, with the help of the tide, I went at the rate of a league and a half an hour, as near as I could guess. My master and his friends continued on the shore till I was almost out of sight, and I often heard the sorrel nag, who always loved me, crying out, Hanya ilya nea maja yahoo. Take care of thyself, gentle yahoo. My design was, if possible, to discover some small island uninhabited, yet sufficient by my labour, to furnish me with the necessaries of life, which I would have thought a greater happiness than to be first minister in the politest court of Europe. So horrible was the idea I conceived of returning to live in society and under the government of Yahoos. For in such a solitude as I desired, I could at least enjoy my own thoughts, and reflect with delight on the virtues of those inimitable Houyhnhnms, without an opportunity of degenerating into the vices and corruptions of my own species. The reader may remember what I related when my crew conspired against me and confined me to my cabin. How I continued there several weeks, without knowing what course we took, and when I was put ashore in the longboat, how the sailors told me with oaths, whether true or false, that they knew not in what part of the world we were. However, I did then believe us to be about ten degrees southward of the Cape of Good Hope, or about forty-five degrees southern latitude, as I gathered from some general words I overheard among them, being, I suppose, to the south-east in their intended voyage to Madagascar. And although this was little better than conjecture, yet I resolved to steer my course eastward, hoping to reach the south-west coast of New Holland, and perhaps some such island as I desired lying westward of it. The wind was full west, and by six in the evening I computed I had gone eastward at least eighteen leagues, when I spied a very small island about half a league off, which I soon reached. It was nothing but a rock, with one creek naturally arched by the force of tempests. Here I put in my canoe, and climbing a part of the rock, I could plainly discover land to the east, extending from south to north. I lay all night in my canoe, and repeating my voyage early in the next morning, I arrived in seven hours to the southeast point of New Holland. This confirmed me in the opinion I have long entertained, that the maps and charts place this country at least three degrees more to the east than it really is, which thought I communicated many years ago to my worthy friend Mr. Herman Moll, and gave him my reasons for it although he has rather chosen to follow other authors. I saw no inhabitants in the place where I landed, and, being unarmed, I was afraid of venturing far into the country. I found some shellfish on the shore, and ate them raw, not daring to kindle a fire for fear of being discovered by the natives. I continued three days feeding on oysters and limpets, to save my own provisions and I fortunately found a brook of excellent water, which gave me great relief. On the fourth day, venturing out early a little too far, I saw twenty or thirty natives upon a height not above five hundred yards from me. They were stark naked, men, women, and children, 
round a fire, as I could discover by the smoke. One of them spied me, and gave notice to the rest. Five of them advanced towards me, leaving the women and children at the fire. I made what haste I could to the shore, and getting into my canoe, shoved off. The savages, observing me retreat, ran after me, and before I could get far enough into the sea, discharged an arrow which wounded me deeply on the inside of my left knee. I shall carry the mark to my grave. I apprehended the arrow might be poisoned, and paddling out of reach of their darts, being a calm day, I made a shift to suck the wound and dress it as well as I could. I was at a loss what to do, for I durst not return to the same landing place, but stood to the north, and was forced to paddle, for the wind, though very gentle, was against me, blowing north-west. As I was looking about for a secure landing place, I saw a sail to the north-northeast, which, appearing every minute more visible, I was in some doubt whether I should wait for them or not. But, at last, my detestation of the Yahoo race prevailed, and turning my canoe, I sailed and paddled together to the south, and got into the same creek whence I set out in the morning, choosing, rather, to trust myself among these barbarians than live with the European Yahoos. I drew up my canoe as close as I could to the shore, and hid myself behind a stone by the little brook, which, as I have already said, was excellent water. The ship came within half a league of this creek, and sent a long boat with vessels to take in fresh water, for the place, it seems, was very well known. But I did not observe it till the boat was almost on shore, and it was too late to seek another hiding place. The seamen at their landing observed my canoe, and rummaging it all over, easily conjectured that the owner could not be far off. Four of them, well armed, searched every cranny and lurking hole, till at last they found me flat on my face behind the stone. They gazed a while in admiration at my strange, uncouth dress, my coat made of skins, my wooden-soled shoes, and my furred stockings. Whence, however, they concluded, I was not a native of the place, who all go naked. One of the seamen, in Portuguese, bid me rise, and asked who I was. I understood that language very well, and getting upon my feet, said, I was a poor Yahoo, banished from the Whinhams, and desired they would please to let me depart. They admired to hear me answer them in their own tongue, and saw by my complexion I must be a European, but were at a loss to know what I meant by Yahoos and Whinhams and at the same time fell a-laughing at my strange tone in speaking, which resembled the neighing of a horse. I trembled all the while betwixt fear and hatred. I again desired leave to depart, and was gently moving to my canoe, but they laid hold of me, desiring to know what country I was of, whence I came, with many other questions. I told them I was born in England, whence I came about five years ago, and then their country and ours were at peace. I therefore hoped they would not treat me as an enemy, since I meant them no harm, but was a poor Yahoo seeking some desolate place where to pass the remainder of his unfortunate life. When they began to talk, I thought I never heard or saw anything more unnatural for it appeared to me as monstrous as if a dog or a cow should speak in England, or a yahoo in Whinhamland. The honest Portuguese were equally amazed at my strange dress, and the odd manner of delivering my words, which, however, they understood very well. They spoke to me with great humanity, and said, They were sure the captain would carry me gratis to Lisbon, whence I might return to my own country that two of the seamen would go back to the ship, inform the captain of what they had seen, and receive his orders. In the meantime, unless I would give my solemn oath not to fly, they would secure me by force. I thought it best to comply with their proposal, 
they were very curious to know my story, but I gave them very little satisfaction, and they all conjectured that my misfortunes had impaired my reason. In two hours the boat, which was laden with vessels of water, returned, with the captain's command to fetch me on board. I fell on my knees to preserve my liberty, but all was in vain, and the men, having tied me with cords, heaved me into the boat, whence I was taken into the ship, and thence into the captain's cabin. His name was Pedro de Mendez. He was a very courteous and generous person. He entreated me to give some account of myself, and desired to know what I would eat or drink, said I should be used as well as himself, and spoke so many obliging things that I wondered to find such civilities from a yahoo. However, I remained silent and sullen. I was ready to faint at the very smell of him and his men. At last I desired something to eat out of my own canoe, but he ordered me a chicken and some excellent wine, and then directed I should be put to bed in a very clean cabin. I would not undress myself, but lay on the bedclothes, and in half an hour stole out, when I thought the crew was at dinner and getting to the side of the ship, was going to leap into the sea and swim for my life, rather than continue among the yahoos. But one of the seamen prevented me, and having informed the captain, I was chained to my cabin. After dinner, Don Pedro came to me, and desired to know my reason for so desperate an attempt. Assured me, he only meant to do me all the service he was able and spoke so very movingly, that at last I descended to treat him like an animal which had some little portion of reason. I gave him a very short relation of my voyage, of the conspiracy against me by my own men, of the country where they set me on shore, and my five years of residence there. All which he looked upon as if it were a dream or a vision, whereat I took great offence for I had quite forgot the faculty of lying, so peculiar to yahoos, in all the countries where they preside, and, consequently, their disposition of suspecting truth in others of their own species. I asked him whether it were the custom in his country to say the thing which was not. I assured him I had almost forgot what he meant by falsehood, and if I had lived a thousand years in Huynhamland, I should never have heard a lie from the meanest servant, that I was altogether indifferent whether he believed me or not, but, however, in return for his favours, I would give so much allowance to the corruption of his nature, as to answer any objection he would please to make, and then he might easily discover the truth. The captain, a wise man, after many endeavours to catch me tripping in some part of my story, at last began to have a better opinion of my veracity. But he added, that, since I professed so inviolable an attachment to truth, I must give him my word and honour to bear him company in this voyage, without attempting anything against my life, or else he would continue me as a prisoner till we arrived at Lisbon. I gave him the promise he required, but at the same time protested, that I would suffer the greatest hardships, rather than return to live among the Yahoos. A voyage passed without any considerable accident. In gratitude to the captain, I sometimes sat with him in his earnest request, and strove to conceal my antipathy against humankind, although it often broke out, which he suffered to pass without observation. But the greatest part of the day I confined myself to my cabin, to avoid seeing any of the crew. The captain had often entreated me to strip myself of my savage dress, and offered to lend me the best suit of clothes he had. This I would not be prevailed on to accept, a boring to cover myself with anything that had been on the back of a yahoo. I only desired he would lend me two clean shirts, which, having been washed since he wore them, I believed would not so much defile me. These I changed every second day, and washed them myself. We arrived at Lisbon, November 5th, 1715. At our landing the captain forced me to cover myself with his cloak, 
to prevent the rabble from crowding about me. I was conveyed to his own house, and, at my earnest request, he led me up to the highest room backwards. I conjured him to conceal from all persons what I had told him of the Houyhnhnms, because the least hint of such a story would not only draw numbers of people to see me, but probably put me in danger of being imprisoned or burnt by the Inquisition. The captain persuaded me to accept a suit of clothes newly made, but I would not suffer the tailor to take my measure. However, Don Pedro being almost of my size, they fitted me well enough. He accoutred me with other necessaries, all new, which I aired for twenty-four hours before I would use them. The captain had no wife, nor above three servants, none of which were suffered to attend at meals, and his whole deportment was so obliging, added to a very good human understanding, that I really began to tolerate his company. He gained so far upon me, that I ventured to look out of the back window. By degrees I was brought into another room, whence I peeped into the street, but drew my head back in a fright. In a week's time he seduced me down to the door. I found my terror gradually lessened, but my hatred and contempt seemed to increase. I was at last bold enough to walk the street in his company, but kept my nose well stopped with rue or sometimes with tobacco. In ten days, Don Pedro, to whom I had given some account of my domestic affairs, put it upon me, as a matter of honour and conscience, that I ought to return to my native country, and live at home with my wife and children. He told me there was an English ship in the port just ready to sail, and he would furnish me with all things necessary. It would be tedious to repeat his arguments and my contradictions. He said, it was altogether impossible to find such a solitary island as I desired to live in, but I might command in my own house, and pass my time in a manner as recluse as I pleased. I complied at last, finding I could not do better. I left Lisbon the twenty-fourth day of November, in an English merchantman, but who was the master I never inquired. Don Pedro accompanied me to the ship, and lent me twenty pounds. He took kind leave of me, and embraced me at a parting, which I bore as well as I could. During this last voyage I had no commerce with the master or any of his men, but, pretending I was sick, kept clothes in my cabin. On the 5th of December, 1715, we cast anchor in the Downs, about nine in the morning, and, at three in the afternoon, I got safe to my house at Rotherheath. My wife and family received me with great surprise and joy, because they concluded me certainly dead. But, I must freely confess, the sight of them filled me only with hatred, disgust, and contempt, and the more by reflecting on the near alliance I had to them. For although, since my unfortunate exile from the Wynnum country, I had compelled myself to tolerate the sight of Yahoos, and to converse with Don Pedro de Mendez, yet my memory and imagination were perpetually filled with the virtues and ideas of those exalted Houyhnhnms. And when I began to consider that, by copulating with one of the Yahoo species, I had become a parent of more, it struck me with the utmost shame, confusion, and horror. As soon as I entered the house, my wife took me in her arms and kissed me, at which, having not been used to the touch of that odious animal for so many years, I fell into a swoon for almost an hour. At the time I am writing, it is five years since my last return to England. During the first year I could not endure my wife or children in my presence. The very smell of them was intolerable. Much less could I suffer them to eat in the same room. To this hour they dare not presume to touch my bread or drink out of the same cup. Neither was I ever able to let one of them take me by the hand. The first money I laid out was to buy two young stone horses, which I keep in a good stable, and next to them the groom is my greatest favourite, 
for I feel my spirits revived by the smell he contracts in the stables. My horses understand me tolerably well. I converse with them at least four hours every day. They are strangers to bridle or saddle. They live in great amity with me and friendship to each other. End of Part 4 Chapter 11《Part Four, Chapter Twelve of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part Four, A Voyage to the Country of the Houyhnhnms. Chapter Twelve, The Author's Veracity. His design in publishing this work, his censure of those travellers who swerve from the truth, the author clears himself from any sinister ends in writing, an objection answered, the method of planting colonies, his native country commended, the right of the crown to those countries described by the author is justified, the difficulty of conquering them, the author takes his last leave of the reader, proposes his manner of living for the future, gives good advice, and concludes. Thus, gentle reader, I have given thee a faithful history of my travels for sixteen years and above seven months, wherein I have not been so studious of ornament as of truth. I could, perhaps, like others, have astonished thee with strange and probable tales, but I rather chose to relate plain matter of fact in the simplest manner and style because my principal design was to inform and not to amuse thee. It is easy for us who travel into remote countries, which are seldom visited by Englishmen or other Europeans, to form descriptions of wonderful animals both at sea and land, whereas a traveller's chief aim should be to make men wiser and better, and to improve their minds by the bad as well as good example of what they deliver concerning foreign places. I could heartily wish a law was enacted that every traveller, before he were permitted to publish his voyages, should be obliged to make oath before the Lord High Chancellor that all he intended to print was absolute truth to the best of his knowledge. For then the world would no longer be deceived, as it usually is, while some writers, to make their works pass the better upon the public, impose the grossest falsities on the unwary reader. I have perused several books of travel with great delight in my younger days, but having since gone over most parts of the globe, and been able to contradict many fabulous accounts from my own observation, it has given me a great disgust against this part of reading, and some indignation to see the credulity of mankind so impudently abused. Therefore, since my acquaintance were pleased to think my poor endeavours might not be unacceptable to my country, I imposed on myself, as a maxim never to be swerved from, that I would strictly adhere to truth. Neither, indeed, can I be ever under the least temptation to vary from it, while I retain in my mind the lectures and examples of my most noble master, and the other illustrious Winans, of whom I had so long the honour to be their humble hearer. Nec si miserum fortuna synonym finixit, vanum etiam, Menda quemque improba finget. I know very well how little reputation is to be got by writings which require neither genius nor learning, nor indeed any other talent except a good memory or an exact journal. I know likewise that writers of travels, like dictionary makers, are sunk into oblivion by the weight and bulk of those who came last, and therefore lie uppermost and it is highly probable that such travellers, who shall hereafter visit the countries described in this work of mine, may, by detecting my errors, if there be any, and adding many new discoveries of their own, jostle me out of vogue, and stand in my place making the world forget that ever I was an author. This, indeed, would be too great a mortification, if I wrote for fame. But my sole intention was the public good, I cannot be altogether disappointed. 
for who can read of the virtues I have mentioned in the glorious Winans, without being ashamed of his own vices, when he considers himself as the reasoning, governing animal of his country? I shall say nothing of those remote nations where Yahoos preside, among which the least corrupted are the Brobding Nangians, whose wise maxims in morality and government it would be our happiness to observe. But I forbear discanting further, and rather leave the judicious reader to his own remarks and application. I am not a little pleased that this work of mine can possibly meet with no censures. For what objections can be made against a writer who relates only plain facts that happened in such distant countries, where we have not the least interest with respect either to trade or negotiations? I have carefully avoided every fault with which common writers of travels are often too justly charged. Besides, I meddle not the least with any party, but write without passion, prejudice, or ill will against any man or number of men whatsoever. I write for the noblest end, to inform and instruct mankind, over whom I may, without breach of modesty, pretend to some superiority from the advantages I received from conversing so long among the most accomplished Winhams. I write without any view to profit or praise. I never suffer a word to pass that may look like reflection, or possibly give the least offence, even to those who are most ready to take it. So that I hope I may, with justice, pronounce myself an author perfectly blameless against whom the tribes of answerers, considerers, observers, reflectors, detectors, remarkers, will never be able to find matter for exercising their talents. I confess it was whispered to me that I was bound in duty, as a subject of England, to have given a memorial to a secretary of state at my first coming over, because whatever lands are discovered by a subject belong to the crown. But I doubt whether our conquests in the countries I treat of would be as easy as those of Ferdinando Cortez over the naked Americans. The Lilliputians, I think, are hardly worth the charge of a fleet and army to reduce them, and I question whether it might be prudent or safe to attempt the Brobdingnagians, or whether an English army would be much at their ease with the flying island over their heads. The Huynhams, indeed, appear not to be so well prepared for war, a science to which they are perfect strangers, and especially against missive weapons. However, supposing myself be a minister of state, I could never give my advice for invading them. Their prudence, unanimity, unacquaintedness with fear, and their love for their country, would amply supply all defects in the military art. Imagine twenty thousand of them breaking into the midst of a European army, confounding the ranks, overturning the carriages, battering the warriors' faces into mummy by terrible yerks from their hinder foots. For they would well deserve the character given to Augustus, the calcitrat underquae tutus. But, instead of proposals for conquering that magnanimous nation, I rather wish they were in a capacity or disposition to send a sufficient number of their inhabitants for civilizing Europe, by teaching us the first principles of honour, justice, truth, temperance, public spirit, fortitude, chastity, friendship, benevolence, and fidelity. The names of all which virtues are still retained among us in most languages, and are to be met with in modern as well as ancient authors, which I am able to assert from my own small reading. But I had another reason which made me less forward to enlarge His Majesty's dominions by my discoveries. To say the truth, I had conceived a few scruples with relation to the distributive justice of princes upon those occasions. For instance, a crew of pirates are driven by a storm they know not whither. At length the boy discovers land from the topmast. They go on shore to rob and plunder. They see a harmless people, are entertained with kindness. They give the country a new name, they take formal possession of it for their king, they set up a rotten plank or a stone for a memorial, they murder two or three dozen of the natives, bring away a couple more by force for a sample, return home and get their pardon. 
Here commences a new dominion acquired with a title by divine right. Ships are sent with the first opportunity, the natives driven out or destroyed, their princes tortured to discover their gold, a free license given to all acts of inhumanity and lust, the earth reeking with the blood of its inhabitants. And this excretable crew of butchers, employed in so pious an expedition, is a modern colony sent to convert and civilize an idolatrous and barbarous people. But this description, I confess, does by no means affect the British nation, who may be an example to the whole world for their wisdom, care, and justice in planting colonies, their liberal endowments for the advancement of religion and learning, their choice of devout and able pastors to propagate Christianity, their caution in stocking their provinces with people of sober lives and conversations, from this the mother kingdom, their strict regard to the distribution of justice, and supplying the civil administration through all their colonies, with officers of the greatest abilities, utter strangers to corruption, and to crown it all, by sending the most vigilant and virtuous governors, who have no other views than the happiness of the people over whom they preside, and the honour of the king their master. But as those countries which I have described, do not appear to have any desire of being conquered and enslaved, murdered or driven out by colonies, nor abound either in gold, silver, sugar, or tobacco, I did humbly conceive they were by no means proper objects of our zeal, our valour, or our interest. However, if those whom it more concerns think fit to be of another opinion, I am ready to dispose, when I shall be lawfully called, that no European did ever visit those countries before me. I mean, if the inhabitants ought to be believed, unless a dispute may arise concerning the two Yahoos, said to have been seen many years ago upon a mountain in land. But as to the formality of taking possession of my sovereign's name, it never once came into my thoughts, and if it had, yet as my affairs then stood, I should perhaps, in point of prudence and self-preservation, have put it off to a better opportunity. Having thus answered the only objection that can ever be raised against me as a traveller, I here take a final leave of all my courteous readers, and return to enjoy my own speculations in my little garden at Redriff, to apply those excellent lessons of virtue which I learned among the Huynhams, to instruct the Yahoos of my own family, as far as I shall find them docible animals, to behold my figure often in the glass, and thus, if possible, habituate myself by time to tolerate the sight of a human creature, to lament the brutality to Huynhams in my own country, but always treat their persons with respect, for the sake of my noble master, his family, his friends, and the whole Huynham race, whom these of ours have the honour to resemble in all their lineaments however their intellectuals come to degenerate. I began last week to permit my wife to sit at dinner with me, at the farthest end of a long table, and to answer, but with the utmost brevity, the few questions I asked her. Yet the smell of a yahoo continuing very offensive, I always keep my nose well stopped with rue, lavender, or tobacco leaves. And... Although it be hard for a man late in life to remove old habits, I am not altogether out of hopes, in some time, to suffer a neighbour yahoo in my company, without the apprehensions I am yet under of his teeth or his claws. My reconcilement to the yahoo kind in general might not be so difficult. If they would be content with those vices and follies only which nature has entitled them to, I am not in the least provoked at the sight of a lawyer, a pickpocket, a colonel, a fool, a lord, a gamester, a politician, a whoremonger, a physician, an evidence, a suborn, an attorney, a traitor, or the like. This is all according to the due course of things. But when I behold a lump of deformity and disease, both in body and mind, smitten with pride, it immediately breaks all the measure of my patience. Neither shall I ever be able to comprehend how such an animal and such a vice could tally together. The wise and virtuous Huynhams, 
who abound in all excellences that can adorn a rational creature, have no name for this vice in their language, which has no terms to express anything that is evil, except those whereby they describe the detestable qualities of their yahoos, among which they were not able to distinguish this of pride, for want of thoroughly understanding human nature, as it shows itself in other countries where that animal presides. But I, who had more experience, could plainly observe some rudiments of it among the wild yahoos. But the Huinams who live under the government of reason are no more proud of the good qualities they possess than I should be for not wanting a leg or an arm, which no man in his wits would boast of, although he must be miserable without them. I dwell the longer upon this subject from the desire I have to make the society of an English yahoo by any means not insupportable. And therefore I here entreat that those who have any tincture of this absurd vice, that they will not presume to come in my sight. End of part four, chapter twelve. End of Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift.